Well, good evening, everyone. I'm going to make a start. And I'm interested to see what happens on the screen over there. So uh, this is a very special occasion. This is the very first forum for the International Teacher Education Effectiveness Research Hub. And I'll say more about that in the moment. But I would start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land. I pay respect to elders both past and present of the Kulin Nation and I expect I extend that respect to other Indigenous Australians present. You'll find out more about this, but this is uh, being... Uh, I, I just welcome Tony Abrahams, who's in the front row, and he's with AI Media, and this is not irrelevant to some elements of what we're doing today. The Teaching a Education Effectiveness Research Hub, within, it's within the Centre for Program Evaluation, was launched in July this year. What's been clear, and you know we've had eight years now of developing our Master of Teaching, there's actually not a lot of rev evidence out there of what does make effective teacher education. And so we thought it was time to have an international hub, and we do have partners uh, throughout Australia and in different parts of the world, but it includes things like Teacher Selector, and that of course has some uh, relevance for tonight, and Visible Classrooms, and that has relevance to what you're seeing up there. But it's about evidence for the proper preparation and continuing growth of teachers, both in a pre-service and then post-service mode. So as I mentioned, this is the inaugural forum. What is a sophisticated approach to selecting candidates for teacher education? Uh, in part, I am perhaps responsible for the focus of tonight because I was involved with TMAG and Recommendation 10. I quote, higher education providers select the best candidates into teaching using sophisticated approaches that ensure initial teacher education students possess the required academic skills and personal characteristics to become a successful teacher. So that's essentially the focus for tonight. So the forum... Uh, I'm going to pass over to John Hattie in one second. We're going to have to move this contraption over onto his shoulders. Uh, he'll make some opening remarks. Janet Clinton will introduce the forum to topic. Uh, Larissa McLean-Davies will contextualise it. George, Georgia Dawson is going to talk about the teacher selector, which I've made reference to. And then where to next? What are the possibilities and implications? Then Mar with, with Janet, then Marjorie Evans is going to uh, give us a response and then lead a Q&A discussion. And I think, John, you're going to then wrap it up at the end. But I'll pass over to you. I just have to be down the other end of town by 6.30, so I'm going to stay for as long as I can and then have to race. But I do hope it all goes well. So welcome to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. And, um Field has introduced the notion that TMAG made recommendation 10 last Friday. Education Council, which is the council of all the ministers, state and federal, got together and approved the selection guidelines. And so now, as of um, next year, institutions will be asked to implement 
sophisticated selection guidelines. And that's a really fascinating topic about what sophisticated selection guidelines are. I want to start back with what is the evidence, and probably you know, the best thing is to start at the beginning. How do we start at the beginning to make sure that we get the right people into the teacher education programs? On the one hand, when you look at the evidence, there's not a lot out there to show us what are the best predictors. So in one sense, that means the answer is not much. You can do what you like. Anything goes. The other alternative is to ask, how do we build an evidence base? And certainly if I have any influence over the implementation of TMAG, one of the biggest um, things I'd like to leave is the sense that there will be an evidence base where we can start to ask these questions. There are not simple answers. On the one hand, as I'm sure we'll see during this session, we do know a lot about prior achievement. Uh, much as we hate to acknowledge it, IQ is still one of the best predictors of job performances in, that we know of. That won't go down very well. On the non-academic, because as Field said, the selection processes ask that institutions use both academic and non-academic measures, there are many contenders. There are many ways how we can look at the proportions and how we weight them. But the question we need to also ask is what are we predicting? On the one hand, we'd like to think we're predicting success of future teachers in their classrooms. But let's get real. We have to ask a prior question. Are we selecting the right people who will profit from a teacher education experience? Here's a problem. If you look at the end point of teacher education, there's not a hell of a lot of variance. There's a recent report came out from the US, because it would never happen in Australia. And it notes, for example, that um, grading standards for teacher candidates, 70% of them get A's compared to 34% in every other discipline across the universities. So in teacher education in the US, you get an A or you get a lawyer. <laughs> the other thing it found is that um, the grading standards of teacher candidates are much lower than for any other students on campus. They also noted there is a strong link, this is the one that's interesting, between getting high grades in teacher education and a lack of rigorous coursework. Now, that's some of the evidence we need to face, and our critics will pick that up and have a field day. Where is our evidence base? And I think that's one of the major purposes of what we're hearing today, building it. Because there is a lot of excellence out there, and it's how we capture that evidence. Now, my job's not to outline the research, because that's coming, but the imperative of undertaking it and not depending on both overseas stuff that doesn't apply to here and the anecdotes which dominate. And certainly as I've been around Australia talking to ministers, talking to uh, department officials, to talking to members of the public and particularly talking to teacher educators, I'm sick of anecdotes. They don't convince anyone. We do need this kind of work. The cost is too great for not getting it right. I know that in teacher education in Australia we, we introduce 30,000 new students every year across the 806 programs. 30,000. 15,000 graduate each year. Here's my question to the hub. Are we retaining the right half? Now, that's a very good question. But like all research, I'm sure there's no, going to be no clean takeaways. There is going to be no silver bullets. But there is no excuse for not doing the research to the higher standards. And there is an imperative to ask the right questions. And that's what I'm looking forward to tonight. Um, it's really exciting to be here. And what we want to do is to get down to discussing the notion of selection. Um, before I start, Phil just asked me to um, mention to you that the minister and his team uh, had fully expected to be here but are now on apology. And uh, he uh, sends his best wishes and his full support um, about what we are discussing. So, when considering the notion of selection of pre-service teachers and candidates, one of the things that we need to think about is what's the logic behind the idea 
of rigorous, sophisticated and transparent selection systems. <coughs> the logic from our perspective is that if we select the right people and as they commence their teacher training, which is effective, they meet the graduate standards and are classroom ready, they will have an impact on student attainment and students' opportunity to learn. There is the notion that the selection has some relationship to the end game. And in many ways, what we need to be doing is starting at that end point so we can actually think about the backward design. And it's one of the things we want to talk to you about today. So what are, what are the pathways? What do our teachers, our teacher candidates, need to achieve? Well, the one thing we know is all of them need to create a pathway to effective teachers which is underpinned by our standards. To become a graduating teacher, we can say that our teachers have a high level of professional knowledge, that they can engage in professional, professional practice and that they will engage in a professional manner. So we have the standards to work back from. We're trying to predict whether the people, the candidates that we select, will be able to adhere to the standards. Not an easy thing as you would imagine. What I want you to also think about is the complexity of a teacher's <coughs> task. What's required for a teacher to adhere to the standards, to practice in a, an effective manner? In essence, if you think about uh, what we've got on the screen, Teachers need to have a multitude of neurons firing at the same time to be able to cope in a classroom situation, to bring to bear um, the learning design, to ensure that they are teaching so that students can master the content, so that they are evaluating learning as they go. We've heard from John Hattie's work that for a teacher to be effective, they need to have particular mind frames. Well, that does require the teacher's brain, which I'm sure is very complex, to be working incredibly hard all at once. So we have the teacher. Now, what I want you to do for a minute is imagine that the teacher is being placed in another complex environment. And within that environment, you have students, you have parents, other teachers, the whole school community. So we've got a mixture of human beings who all have different agendas, different levels of readiness for learning and teaching. So I want to demonstrate the complexity of the school environment and what we're trying to do in predicting the kind of person who can cope in this particular context. Many of you would have seen the movie Inside Out. And I have to tell you, last week, um, as I flew back from the UK, uh, this was the highlight of my plane flight. There aren't many in a long haul trip. Um, but watching Inside Out for the second time was one of them. And it occurred to me while I was watching, what would a teacher's um, emotional brain look like? And lo and behold, as we looked at the complex development of the adolescent, Riley the adolescent, who had her little troop of emotions, fear, disgust, anger, joy, every aspect of her behaviour and thinking was played out in this very complex emotions. And then, of course, you had the parent, and as you would know, as a teacher, parents are often as scary as the kids. So uh, as we looked at aspects of what was happening in um, a parent's life, dealing with their young child, you could see, again, 
the multitude of emotions, attitudes, ideas playing out. And then in the middle we had our wonderful teacher where Riley turns up to her new school where her emotions, fear, anger and disgust and sadness were playing out quite a lot in that classroom. And what we were exposed to is seeing the teacher and the teacher's reaction and to this environment that she was in and how her brain was coping with these 30 young people in front of her and their various emotions. And what you'll see on the slide up there is that the teachers, each of the teachers' emotional states were thinking about vacation, coping, anger came into play, a whole range of characteristics. If you haven't seen the movie, it's worth a look. One of the things that we are trying to do is to predict who can cope in that particular environment. So what do we need? You've heard from John already discussing the critical factors in effective education. If you look at the literature, and I guess what we're trying to do is contextualise where we fit as teacher educators. And you look at the literature and thinking about who do we select? What do we use to select them? And how do we use those things? You have to consider what we have some control over. What we can actually dive into. And I would put to you that we have little control of the context. Where our students come from, where they want to go. We have little control over what has happened in terms of their previous achievement um, and, as John has mentioned, ability. So when we think about selection, what we're really trying to dive into is this space where a teacher candidate puts themselves forward and says, this is what I want, here's my motivation. And it's that space, that cognitive and non-cognitive space that relates to teaching that we're looking at. So where do we start? And that's what we're really going to focus on. Before I move to Larissa, to, who's going to discuss some of the evidence around selection procedures, I want to uh, make a special note about the role of teacher education in all of this. It is a team effort. Once we select candidates into this process, we're bringing them into a profession. And the role of us as teacher educators is to contribute to that profession. It is important that along the way we are having an impact on our students from wherever they come from, wherever they start. Once we select them and we use our mechanisms to select them, we form a partnership that says we will carry you along this pathway. So along the way we're committed to building, connecting skill, theory and practice, giving them the knowledge that they need to cope in that complex environment. We're also committed to measuring our own impact on that process as well as, and we know from TMAG, now the impact that our candidates have when they're actually out in the classroom. And throughout this forum, what we want you to do is hold on to our role as teacher educators and what part do we play in building this workforce and creating a profession. What I'm going to do is to um, hand over to Larissa, who's going to talk to you about the process of selection and the evidence required to make good decisions. Thanks, Janet. Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to talk now about, particularly about the processes of selection. Can I just have an indication of who was selected into a teacher preparation course at some stage in their lives? 
So it's quite likely that that was through a whole range of different measures. Uh, different times would have looked at different things. What we're arguing for here, what we're presenting here, is a coherent, robust, sophisticated way of approaching selection and one where a great deal of care is taken about who is the person that's going to be invited into this program, who's given the opportunity to become a teacher. So this small part of the presentation is really about aligning uh, those threads that have come through so far, teacher education, effectiveness, the notion of selection, and then um, our colleague Georgia will be talking particularly about some work that we've done here at the University of Melbourne with Teacher Selector. So before I move into teacher education and selection for that, let's just review for a moment what we do know and what we've heard already about selection into university courses. So we know that GPA, grade point average, is the best predictor of success in an academic program in a university. So, and John talked about it as the intelligence test. If you're, if you're strong and successful coming into a program, it's most likely that you will be more likely to be successful in that program. However, of course, the professions make it more complex. It's not simply about academic achievement. And we know this very well from our colleagues in medicine who started testing for things other than simply ATAR or simply the results that were, that were achieved at the end of high school or at the end of an undergraduate degree. We know that in the professions there are other aspects, and we've already heard a little bit about those. Drive, self-reliance, willpower, patience, integrity, passion, connection, optimism, self-confidence and communication, arguably things that we think are very important uh, when we're entering into a professional space. Janet's um, taken us through some of the complexities of being a teacher and the fact that we need those, teachers need to have those qualities to be able to cope with what is um, arguably the most challenging profession, I would argue, uh, that we have. So we know that these things are in combination. And as I've already indicated, there's been great work in, in parallel professions, I would argue, to, to our own profession in medicine. So some of you will be aware that at the University of Melbourne we have a clinical model of pre-service teacher education and we've spent some time thinking of what we can learn through medicine and through clinical teaching that can have affordances for us as teacher educators. And so the work that's done in medicine around selection, we are arguing, also has a bearing for the work that we are doing broadly as teacher educators. So what we've seen in Scottish medical schools is that a range of, of factors, including testing, have a positive access for widening access to medicine. So if you're only testing, if you're only interested in GPA, then you might be missing people who have other really important characteristics. And it's about using professional judgment, that is judgment on the part of the institution, judgment on the part of the university to, um, to make some decisions about entry into a course. A little closer to home at the University of Newcastle, we see that longitudinal study shows that those candidates, um, doctors who have been selected according to a range of factors, are more likely to be successful over time. And so we know that in other professions there are um, different measures that are very important to look at. So what is it? Why is it that we feel some anxiety about the discussion of selecting teachers and using a range of features? What is it? Maybe we don't. Maybe we're all in this room really fully on board with a sophisticated and robust way of selecting teachers. But if we're not, there might be some anxiety about it. And some of the, and you'll see that on the slide, some of it might be around the rhetoric around teaching. That idea that teaching is natural, that everybody can do it, which we're arguing they can't and they shouldn't. Um, but the fact that it's something that's sort of innate, something that's there that you don't need to sort of learn. Not sure about the role of teacher education in that kind of scenario. There is none. Um, but nonetheless, that's the kind of rhetoric that we hear. And of course, we know that out there in the world, most people have been to school. And so they therefore have a view of what makes an effective teacher. And so we're dealing with a public discourse in a way that's quite significant. Pam Grossman talks about the challenges of the professional status of teaching being around the fact that it is deprofessionalised in the way people are thinking about it. 
She says one of the challenges faced by efforts to gain professional status is that teaching is complex work that looks deceptively simple. But we know, of course, that it is not at all simple. So when we're thinking about selection, some of those myths, some of those preconceptions about what makes a teacher and who can be teachers are undoubtedly playing into that. I guess we're arguing that we need to revisit some of those assumptions and some of those concerns around using selection. So moving on then to think about what research has been done around selection, ways of selecting candidates into university courses. So these are, what you're seeing represented here, are a range of measures that are used to select uh, candidates into any university courses, but at the Hub we've looked particularly at the ones that are relevant to the selection of teachers. And so what you're seeing here are a list of features, of tests, of uh, ways of selection that are used in teacher education courses around the world. And what you're seeing represented by the ticks and the crosses are the single features that on their own are either considered to be strong, so you see the grade point average at the top there, that's considered to be a strong measure of um, testing for success in a program, uh, but other features are considered to be less strong. Now what's really interesting is that research literature is showing that in fact the most powerful uh, way of thinking about selection is putting these features in combination, is not just having one of these measures. So even the GPA, which we argue is the strongest, in fact can be strengthened by putting in dialogue with other kinds of assessment. So we're really interested in the combination of measures that can be used for selection. And you'll see there the idea that everything's connected. If we are going to take seriously the work that teachers do, which is not just cognitive, but is absolutely interpersonal, where a whole lot of non-cognitive factors really need to be considered, then we must have a selection process that acknowledges that, that acknowledges that is the work of teachers and really names that and, uh, and I would argue claims that as a part of our professional identity. So this is important, um, just to recap. There's no evidence that just one measure on its own is more effective than another in predicting a teacher's impact on student achievement. But what we do see is beginning evidence of a range of factors, and this is certainly the research of the hub and the research that we think really needs to be done at this point. What are those factors in combination? And, and Georgia will talk a little bit more about that in the next part of our, our session. And the other thing that we can also be very certain about is that there is evidence of a range of effectiveness in teacher education programs. And John and Janet have both spoken about that already. So let's think about those two things in combination. If we know that some teacher education programs are more or less effective than others, then we need to see what is it about those programs. And we would argue that selection is a key part of that consideration. So in trying to discern and to research what are the aspects of selection that we should consider, how can we broadly consider selection so that it's sophisticated and robust, we are also feeding into questions of and research around the effectiveness more broadly of teacher education. There are concerns that people have, and I've alluded to that at the start of this little part, around what if we do implement these robust features? What about equity? Will we, if we ha suddenly have these different features around selection, will we be marginalising certain kinds of candidates? Will we be not um, supporting candidates in the way that we need to? Now, obviously, that is very much something that the university, all universities, need to take responsibility for. And the way in which we decide on the factors that we use, the measures that we use, needs to be, reflect that commitment to equity and to diversity. Another issue is, and I know Georgia will take this up, how do we give feedback to candidates? Arguably one of the greatest strengths in having a range of sophisticated features to select teacher candidates is to be able to then support those candidates as they come into practice. We know that the very first national standard for graduate teachers is to know your students. Well, as teacher educators, we also need to know our students. We need to know them very well so that we can then support them on their journey through teacher education and beyond. And I guess the last, um, almost the last thing I want to leave you with, with just this part, is that any selection procedure must recognise the important role of 
professional judgment on the behalf of those who are selecting. It's not an abdication of that responsibility to be very clear and to, to recognise that different tertiary contexts, different social contexts will require nuanced approaches to their selection features. And that's absolutely important that that is done um, with consistent standards but with recognition of local context. And I just wanted to finish with this quote again from, um, from Darling Hammond and colleagues and moving it back again to teacher education. Teaching teachers, which is what many of us are doing, is certainly among the most demanding kinds of professional preparation. And I think we need to recognise that. Teacher educators must constantly model practices, construct powerful learning experiences, thoughtfully support progress, understanding and practice, carefully assess students' progress and understanding and help link theory to practice. If it is that complex, which it is, then we must pay attention to selection and we must see how selection feeds into that and assists us to support the right candidates to become the next generation of teachers. And I'll hand over to Georgia. Hi everyone. So we've heard from um, John and Janet about the context that we find ourselves in and for lots of different reasons. So we're faced with policy, the issues of professionalisation and the complexity of the teaching role. And Larissa has talked to us about the kinds of things that we should be thinking about during selection and the methods that are currently utilised and, and how well those methods are performing. And we've looked at our colleagues in medicine um, to understand what they're doing that we can perhaps draw from. So for the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to dive you into the practical and I'm going to present to you Teacher Selector, which is our stake in the ground, if you like, around uh, teacher selection. And whilst this was done in an environment of policy, um, it was also um, an attempt by us to look at the impact of strategic teacher selection on the future capability of teachers in education. So from our perspective, it's very much a longitudinal prospect it's, um, and a longitudinal commitment from us. And we're in the very, very early phases at the moment. So um, there are two parts to my presentation. The first, we're going to have a look at Teacher Selector. So what's in it and how does it work? And then the second part, we're going to take aspects of it, demonstrate the evidence that we use to include it in the tool and then present what the tool is starting to tell us about our candidates as we select them and as we develop them. So this is just very preliminary evidence. Okay, so this is where we started. GPA, it's a traditional method for candidate number one and it looks a little lonely up there but it's not too bad a measure to base a selection decision on. In fact, we know that the relationship between GPA and university performance is about 0.4 but it's not very sophisticated. So it might be complex in its calculations, but it really doesn't tell us a lot. It's got some transparency, so we know exactly what the decision is based on, but this perhaps sells the notion of transparency short. So transparency is not just about knowing um, how the decision was made, it's about providing a rationale or a logic model and being able to give a candidate rich feedback on the decision. So in essence, it ignores the complexity of teaching and the value of teaching, and it ignores the complexity of a program such as ours, um, where we have practicums and we have classes and we have clinical exams. And that's true for us, but that's equally applied into other programs that have a different structure. And it ignores the complexity of the candidate. So this candidate may get in on their GPA, but what have we learnt about them? Not a lot. And importantly, the candidate actually hasn't learnt much about themselves in that process. <coughs> Which brings us to Teacher Selector. So, um, Teacher Selector offers what we would say is a more generous view of the candidate's abilities and suitabilities for selection into initial teacher education. And that's in an effort to acknowledge this complexity of teaching and the divergent demands that are placed on the student when they're in a clinical teaching program. So
So to borrow from Steve Dinham, he suggests that by making selection more comprehensive, this enhances the fit between candidate and teaching as a career and maximises the chances of a candidate being classroom ready and more committed to the teaching profession. I will say that Teacher Selector was not designed to be the, decision, the selection decision itself, so it relies, as Larissa has already mentioned, on judgement based on the context in which that judgement is being applied. It is multi-module, so it captures a range of information about a potential candidate. And we have two core modules, which are our blue rectangles here. Um, and the, self, the informed self-selection component um, asks a candidate to talk about their reasons for wanting to teach. It also asks them to talk about what they feel are effective characteristics of a teacher and what experience they're bringing to the role. We then have our second core module, which is um, a set of self-assessments that the candidate undertakes. And this is what's involved. And I'll, I'll slowly work through these so you can get a flavour of what's in the tool. So um, there's about 500 items in the tool um, assessing aspects of the self, such as disposition. So that's based on a five-factor model of personality, where we look at factors such as conscientiousness, extroversion, openness, agreeableness and anxiety. We also look at self-regulation and resilience. Then we assess cognitive reasoning, and that's numerical, verbal and non-verbal reasoning. And we look at a candidate's social interaction skills. So we ask them questions around their communication, their cultural sensi sensitivity, and their moral orientation. And the scales were developed and written by a team at the university in consultation with other academics. And each of the factors have a base of evidence on which they have been selected for inclusion in the tool. And that was whether they had a nexus with effective teaching or with effective performance at university or both. Uh, as a tool develops and gains um, use in a number of selection contexts, we have a rolling work plan of empirical validation. And um, to date, this analysis has shown that scales have good psychometric reliability. And we continue to do that as we have more cohorts coming into the tool. So that's our two core modules. And then we have two optional modules, which is a structured behavioural interview. And it's more often utilised for specific contexts, such as scholarship award, um, as an additional source of information and a further depth of information. So it's structured in the sense that it comprises a standard set of questions where there's no deviation for any particular candidate. And it's behavioural in the sense that it asks um, examples of previous situations or it gives a candidate a hypothetical situation and asks them to respond. And that's based on the notion that past behaviour is a good predictor of future behaviour. And then we have our teaching demonstration, which is another optional module, and that's a role play designed to um, provide the candidate the opportunity to showcase their teaching approach and their classroom management skills. So that's what's involved. So what actually happens? So the candidate completes the core module of the tool online um, and this is what it looks like when they go online. So they apply for a login and they receive that via email and they log in via our front screen. They can complete the assessment anywhere and it takes just over an hour. And we have security measures in place to ensure that the fidelity of the assessment is maintained. So for example, our cognitive ability questions are timed so that we don't have Google applying for a position in the teaching. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then after that, the data comes into the teacher selector team, they collate it. Um, it's put together into a spreadsheet in preparation for a selection meeting. And at that point, it's quite vanilla information. So when we hand it over, there's been no treatment to the, to the information at all. It's then up to the individual institution to decide the weighting of their selection decisions. So how they move the dial um, in selecting their candidates. And again, that's part of fitting it into the context in which it's being used. So what might a typical cohort look like? So this is a an example just to show you across and this is the core module of the 25 scales that we talked about on the slide earlier and so this is what 
the average percentage scores might be for a cohort across these scales. And so, for example, we can see that it's quite a high scoring cohort, but we could highlight the fact that some of the verbal scales have a lower score. And we could use that in two ways. We could use that as part of the selection process, so we might only take candidates that are above that mean, or we might use it in a development process, so we may still take candidates in, but we've actually recognised that there may potentially be an issue from a verbal comprehension or a, a vocabulary perspective in the development of those candidates through the course. What does the candidate receive? So our successful candidates receive a feedback report with the intent that this will assist in their development and their planning. And this is just one aspect of the report. So the blue line is this particular candidate's scores on the scales. And then the red and the green line are the scores that are one standard deviation above and below the mean for that particular cohort that they've been selected into. So that candidate can then reflect see where their scores are higher or lower, and think about how that might impact their progression through the course, their activities in the classroom when they go out on practicum. So it's the start of a professional development tool. So that is Teacher Selector um, in terms of how it works. I thought now I'd just like to move on to discuss the evidence base for the inclusion of some of the assessments in the tool and what Teacher Selector is starting to tell us in terms of building its own evidence base. And as much as I'd like to cover all the areas, um, I, I won't today. We'd be here for quite a long time, but the paper that we intend to release will address most of those issues. Um, so this is really just a snapshot of what we're learning about our selection method. So if we look at performance at university, and Larissa has talked about this as well, Meta-analytic studies show that there are several predictors of performance. Previous academic achievement, conscientiousness plays a role in self-regulation. So the most proximal consequence for a selection decision into university, this is important because it's someone's academic performance at uni. So we want to select people who will perform and do well. So, Okay, we know that GPA is important and we would obviously retain that as one of several selection levers, but there are other factors that have shown to be important. Now, conscientious com conscientiousness comes in as important because it's seen as an individual's organisation and their achievement orientation, that those students who tend to be higher on conscientiousness are likely to be more motivated to perform well. And its correlation with university performance is around about 0.2. Um, Self-regulation as it relates to learning is significantly associated with academic performance. So that's things like time study management, effort regulation and help seeking. And as an example, effort regulation um, has one of the highest correlations at about 0.32. So all of these factors are important. When we situate this evidence into initial teacher education, so most courses are structured around classroom-based learning, practical placements, and there's considerable responsibility on the IT candidate to um, develop their content knowledge and their pedagogical knowledge and take responsibility for their professional learning. So self-regulation is an important component of being successful within a teaching course. Um, so Teacher Selector assesses four aspects of self-regulation um, across goal setting, self and environment management task strategies and self-evaluation, and we also look at it in terms of our resilience measure. Um, but what we've found in terms of the, the evidence from our tool is that it's, we've been able to replicate previous research. So conscientiousness, self-regulation and cognitive ability have come up as important predictors in running course performance in one of our cohorts. So our work is supporting the research that's out there already. And also to note that, just building on Larissa's point around not one particular selection method works, um, it's coming from a couple of different areas in the tool. We also think about motivation for teaching. Um, so uh, there's reasonably extensive research around the reasons candidates choose to pursue a career in teaching. Um, and these reasons often influence 
later instructional practice. So, um, teacher selector assesses a candidate's motivations for teaching through free text response items in our informed self-selection component. And the most reported reason we have found for choosing teaching as a career is passion for helping others. And so our research intent is to longitudinally track these groups through their training and into their teaching to career to understand the influence that these motivations might have later on in their practice and effectiveness as an educator. And there's promising evidence that things like attrition, attrition rates have reduced since the use of teacher selector and this may reflect a number of factors including um, the opportunity for candidates to consider their reasons for applying into ITE and to explicitly state those reasons. And finally, the hardest one I guess, is characteristics of effective teachers. And the research around this is a little bit disparate and can be quite haphazard. And I think as John spoke, and a major roadblock in the is a methodological issue of defining what is an effective teacher. And so it's really difficult to draw on this research base to guide the selection of candidates into ITE. Um, but what we have found, interestingly, uh, is that when we ask our own candidates what characteristics of effective teachers are, and we code that loosely around the Ainsel graduate standards, we find that they don't focus a lot on feedback and reflective practice as being a characteristic of effective teaching. So this has helped to inform us about what's important within our course to think about embedding into their development, um, that process and that modelling of feedback to students and reflecting on their own capability. So our future developments, we'll have ongoing validation of our scales and assessments and we will continue to explore these relationships between these constructs that we're measuring in Teacher Selector and our outcome measures and continuing to reform our outcome measures as well. We plan to introduce a situational judgment test which assesses an implicit ability through behavioural tendencies by putting forward hypothetical situations and this, we, we see this as an enhancement because it's procedurally fair, it's been shown to be um, viewed by candidates as being much, a much fairer process and it's bespoke so we can tailor it to an individual institution's needs. So in that way it adds to the sophistication and the transparency of the process. So on the report card for transparency and sophistication, where are we at? Well, it's, we do have a complex method and it's multi-method. So we are referencing several different selection tools within one and the decision is made to select a candidate on multiple data points rather than one. Our measurements are evidence-based, so we're drawing from previous research, but we're also accumulating our own as we go. And um, we have a baseline of a candidate as they come into our course on which further development can be planned. The tool itself has scale and adaptability and it can be tailored to meet different needs. But we're not quite there yet. As we've mentioned, we plan to introduce other assessments such as situational judgment. In terms of transparency, we have a clear rationale and evidence base beneath it and the candidate receives feedback on their information but we're not quite there with that either. But we still have to sort out what we do with candidates that are unsuccessful in terms of providing feedback to them on their investment in filling out Teacher Selector with us. But our information is clear and rich enough to inform our curriculum and our development. So we're on our way, but we're not quite there yet. So I'll hand back to Janet. Okay, so what have we learned so far? If you bring together the evidence that was presented by Larissa and some of the information that you've heard from the work we've been doing with our Teacher Selector tool, what we've been able to do is say to you there's a number of things out there that actually do work better than others in terms of selection. We've pointed out that it's critical to understand context 
We need to understand our candidates, where they are. We know, and you've seen this from the presentation that Georgia just gave, that our candidates are often at varying levels of readiness to take on the work that we want. We also need to understand that each of them, as we saw with our complex um, brain of the teachers, each of their characteristics are all at varying stages and that our candidates have to develop their own personal characteristics at their own pace with the support of us. We need to understand the role of GPA. It's clear that GPA is critical but we also know that it is not the only characteristic. If we use GPA as a selector we are going to get people who are probably going to be successful in completing our assessments and graduating with a degree. It does not necessarily mean that they will have all of the skills necessary to cope in a complex environment such as teaching. We've touched on the role of teacher education and I think we're saying very clearly that our teacher preparation programs need to take a responsibility for having an impact on our candidates and guiding them through to classroom readiness. In terms of the measures, we've suggested to you that there are multiple ways of selection and we do need to consider a multiple um, method and a multi-level assessment. We're also hinting that there needs to be specific guidelines about how we select and what procedures we may use. Right at the beginning, we talked about the notion of having a logic about why we are doing what we're doing. So based on that, what we want to do is take a stance about selection and what we think the definition of sophisticated actually means because this is critical for us as a profession. We've been charged with coming up with robust, sophisticated and transpa transparent measures of teacher selection and that means we need to understand what they are. So we're going to have a shot at telling you what they are. We're also going to suggest to you that given the work that we're doing, it's going to be important that we as a profession develop a set of standards for selection. A set of standards that may actually um, go across all of our preparation programs that guide us into appropriate selection. And perhaps we need to consider a specific framework for this selection process. So, what does sophisticated actually mean? For us, sophistication in a selection process means utilising multiple methods and triangulating them so that they're predictive of success so that we can suggest to our candidates and to our teacher educators that there is a progressive pathway, that there are targets that our candidates can take. We also want to suggest that our selection processes in providing feedback will be useful and most importantly add value to the whole education of our teacher candidates. We want to ensure that feedback to our candidates and to our teacher educators incentivises the notion of developing an evaluative mindset. A mindset that our candidates and our teachers understand that they need to continually critically reflect on concrete information. The information that we provide needs to 
support and evidence base. We need to be able to use this information to connect all of our data sources so that we can say selection does actually relate to the opportunity for our students to learn and to achieve, because today we can't do that. And if our education system is going to be reformed, then we need to understand the connection between what we're doing in developing our teachers and how effective they are. We think that a sophisticated selection process is underpinned by a set of standards for selection, just as we may do with any student assessment. It's also critical that this process we use demonstrates impact for all of the people involved. Our teacher educators need to understand their impact on their candidates. Transparency, it's about feedback for everybody. And that may be from the minister down to our schools. It's also critical that the work we do informs the discipline. You've heard John Hattie say that teacher education is one of the most bereft <coughs> research disciplines we have. You've heard us say today that in many cases we cannot tell you what the relationship is between our selection procedures and student achievement or student opportunity to learn or effective teaching. Heaven knows, can we actually demonstrate what effective teaching really is? Whatever we choose to do in terms of selection, our candidates and our teacher educators need to be clear what the pathway is. It needs to be clear and articulated. So in terms of selection, the hoops, the hurdles for everybody are obvious. Everybody has a chance to jump. The pathway for effective teaching is very clear regardless of the context and that comes back to having that plan right at the beginning. What do we want our teacher education students to achieve? When it comes to the methods we use, the measurement, the approaches need to be rigorous and reproducible. The logic of what we're doing needs to be very, very defensible. Everything we do needs to be understood by all of us. So there's, there's two things that we want to suggest to you that we know we do not have at this stage and that we as a profession should be thinking about developing. And we've mentioned this a little bit. The idea that when we are developing our selection procedures across the country, across our nation, that we need a set of standards to achieve those protocols. In any other profession, if I think about evaluation in particular, student evaluation, student assessment, evaluation generally, we have a set of guidelines that inform us about what we should be trying to achieve. So I've stolen the standards from uh, the International Standards for Evaluation. And what I'm suggesting to you that these standards are a great place to start. The notion that whatever we do in terms of selection, our procedures will be useful. In terms of propriety, the selection procedures will not harm but actually enhance whomever takes the process. And we will not um, interfere with any cultural protocols inappropriately. The procedures need to be feasible so that they don't overtake what we're trying to do. You need to be able to do them easily. They need to be user friendly. I love this next one. I actually need to be right. Whatever we're doing needs to be an evidence-based. It needs to be accurate. We, 
as assessors of our teacher candidates need to be accountable for what we're actually doing. The system needs to be accountable. And most importantly, across the years, it needs to be reproducible. At this point in time, we do not have these standards. Anybody can do whatever they choose to do. TMAG is now suggesting to us that it needs to be sophisticated and transparent. And I would argue to you that there needs to be a set of standards underpinning it to make it both sophisticated and transparent. And finally, what we want to do is to, I guess, suggest a framework for putting this all together, a guiding template, if you like. And this is what we've been trying to do in terms of the hub. Think about the way selection should work. What we're doing is suggesting that the framework at its heart needs to have the standards that we develop as a profession. You've heard us say that context and engagement with all stakeholders, from government to students, is critical. That's where we start. I'm just thinking about right at the very beginning. Um, it makes you want to burst into song. But the idea is that starting with our key stakeholders is critical. From there, we, as a, uh, a program, as a group, we need to understand what it is we're trying to do. We need to articulate the theory of change, the logic of what we're trying to do. And for each institution, determine what it is we want and how much of whatever the characteristic is we want. So we set weightings for cognitive and our non-cognitive views. If, for example, you're in an undergraduate program and you believe that you can take students at a lower level of literacy and numeracy, because they all have to do that test at the end, you've got four years to work with them. Then that's your responsibility to determine what the theory of change is for each of those students and how you're going to take them along the way. Once you've made that determination and you've set your logic in place, what we said to you is multiple methods, multiple me methods at varying levels of assessment is important. One type doesn't work. We would also argue that once you've used multiple methods, which includes prior learning, you need to triangulate them, bring them together so that you understand and the candidate understands where they need to work. Once you've got all that, you can actually make a judgment. And you do, as a teacher education, as a teacher educator, need to make that judgment. Once you've made your judgment, it's clear, it's transparent, then that information needs to be fed back so that we can learn as teachers, that our candidates can learn as future teachers, that we as a discipline can learn and think about the policies that we're making. We would argue this process, if it's cyclic and underpinned by a set of standards, that we may have a way forward in what is sophisticated and transparent. Finally, it all comes back to is we need to create and define transparent and sophisticated processes. Thank you. I'm now going to hand over to Marjorie who's going to raise some questions for us. Uh, thank you very much, Janet, and uh, everyone who's spoken this, this afternoon raised some questions. We have had so much information uh, this afternoon that indeed there are only questions raised. And the biggest question for me, I guess, is what do we do with all this stuff? What do I do uh, with all the questions and the issues that have been raised today as someone who's 
uh, responsibility is to uh, enact TMAG, but I see regulators here, I see teacher educators here, uh, I see, uh, you know, I'm sure a range of graduates and, and, uh, and, and others. What do we do with all of this information? I've drawn out four big themes uh, from what was talked about and I, I, want to, I want to reflect on those because not only has there been a, you know, a huge amount of information talked about today, I think some of it's a bit conflicting. Uh, I think some of it's a bit, uh, there's just not, not enough uh, perhaps uh, practicality about some of it. And so let me draw out those themes. Big theme, we've got to do sophisticated uh, approaches to selection. Can't agree, we've added the word transparency, uh, can agree, can't agree more. We've added the word, I must agree, <laughs> we've added the word uh, transparency to that. We've made the assumption is if we select well, add value in a, uh, throughout a course, then teachers who e exit classroom ready will be great for kids and have a great impact. Again, these are things that we can't challenge. So there's, there's no, uh, no, I guess there's no um, criticism about that. But when we think about what we've done in the past, we've tended to describe selection in ways that have related to literacy and numeracy. The ATAR debate, I think, has often distracted us and yet um, provides some very key messages for us around, uh, around um, the importance or, or what's happened in terms of our students' academic ability. Because my second theme that I've pulled out of the conversation tonight is that there's a real paucity of evidence uh, about what it is that we ought to be selecting for and of. And yet I hear some strong views that uh, IQ, uh, grade point average, are really important predictors. And yet I hear also that they're not quite sophisticated enough. And yet when we talk about some of the, um, what, you know, what are, what are we, uh, what are we trying to predict? Are we trying to predict good teachers? Are we trying to pe predict people who are going to be successful in the course? I hear John talk about the fact that there's lack of discrimination within our own uh, initial teacher education courses, that there's potentially a lack of rigour and that we're persuaded by anecdotes. So we get to the tool that's been talked about this afternoon and of course it's multidimensional and complex, but again the information, um, the analysis that's coming out of it is early work. So what am I left, what am I left with here? The uh, guidelines that have just been passed by Education Council talk about providers setting both academic and non-academic criteria. That will now be required for all providers across all, com uh, across all states. Grade point average, that's pretty clear whether you use ATAR or a range of other things to contribute to that. But what is it that are the, the, the ways and the mechanisms and indeed the uh, priorities we have for that non-academic uh, selection? And again, I can't remember which of you put up the list, was it you, Larissa, put up the list about what are the most useful mechanisms for selection. Unfortunately, the ones with the crosses are the ones that we often rely on. So I think we're very challenged about what are the good predictors in terms of a non-academic uh, base and what are the better mechanisms for, you, for using to make those selections. So John's right when he talks about the, the desperate need, really, to create an evidence base. So yes, we want it to be sophisticated. Yes, we want to increase our evidence base. And then a number of the people that, we, uh, that spoke today talk about complexity. They talk about not, there's not one answer to this problem. They talk about multi-dimensional. Uh, multi uh, they talk about the great complexity of teaching itself. And so are indeed we attempting something that's too tricky? Um, I can't imagine that we are, and I can't imagine that we ought not try to grapple with this. But we need to be careful that we don't either make the selection mechanisms too complex or get a too overwhelmed 
by the complexity of the teaching role. Third thing I, um, I heard talked about was the actual tool itself. And again, huge amounts of information, but I hear that the, um, that the information, that the resources, that the thinking that's happening is new and emergent. And what I have, uh, sitting around uh, our table today, the meeting uh, that John and I were at this, or this afternoon, is people wanting quite specific answers. They're wanting those answers now. Uh, they don't want to sign off on things that where we haven't got a tool or something to offer. And so the challenge uh, immediately is trying to, I think, um, recognise complexity but do it in a way that provides something, uh, at least a starting point for people to uh, select not only on academic but non-academic grounds. I've had the privilege of uh, attending an international program uh, last week that was talking about uh, initial teacher education. And one of the very, um, well, perhaps not surprising for you, but one of the themes that came through very strongly for me was the fact that really very few countries in the world have cracked the selection problem. And where they have, there have been countries like Korea, uh, Singapore, uh, to some extent Hong Kong, where they've had uh, had very high academic standards required, some quite high non-academic standards, but where they've also been able to uh, control the supply and demand. So people are selected for particular jobs, their uh, state nations, if you like, so that people know where they're going. In Australia, we have such a different set of arrangements. We have such a different set of contexts We've got issues of rurality, issues of uh, in indigeneity, all those sorts of things that play into our problem. And so when we look, I think, at our um, global uh, neighbours for advice and for solutions, I'm not sure that we're going to find them there. We're going to find signposts, posts, we're going to find a capacity to uh, get information and, and make choices about it, but I certainly don't think that we're going to find the answers. And so what about, um, what about our, our situation in Australia right now? Well, we do have these guidelines that have been signed off. They say three important things. I've talked about the first, that providers need to set both academic and non-academic criteria. We know that currently, most providers look at academic criteria. Where they look at non-academic criteria is to actually select or allow students to come into programs rather than to discriminate. Very different from a range of our other professions where, in fact, uh, if you've got a whole lot of people wanting to uh, come into medicine, what you're using is your non a number of your non-academic uh, processes to pick the ones that you're going to keep and the ones that you're not. Uh, in education, it's actually the reverse, where people don't have the academic uh, criteria, criteria or the academic measures. Indeed, we often use other measures, measures to select them in. I think it's a challenge we've got to confront. Second, uh, the second requirement now on all providers is that they describe in detail the rationale for their approach, the selection mechanisms used and the threshold entries applied uh, and any exemptions used. So what we're saying is we don't really yet know enough about the selection mechanisms that are going to be the best. Teacher selector is very promising. Is it applicable across the board? Do we have enough evidence yet about it? So universities, providers are encouraged uh, to think about what um, selection mechanisms they're going to use themselves, but they need to be able to provide that rationale, they need to be able to talk about them and they need to demonstrate the cut scores. And then the third thing we're asking is, and this goes to the building of the evidence base, that providers offer all information necessary to ensure transparent and justifiable selection process for, for entry into initial teacher education programs, ex including uh, student cohort data and that that's published. 
So what we need to do, selection mechanism, we've established the, it's got some sort of an evidence base, we've established a cut score. Now we need to be able to report transparently and track the data that allows us to build up a case, us, you, uh, providers, to build up a case to uh, demonstrate whether this is a, a viable, useful, effective uh, mechanism. And so what I talk, took from the, uh, the talk today, what I took from all of the information that we got, is that what we're attempting is hard. What we're attempting is in fact, albeit that there are some lessons relatively new and emerging, but I also took that it's incredibly worthwhile. It's a really important thing that we do. And I go back to John's figures. 30,000 people come into initial teacher education, 15,000 graduate. Now surely that tells us something about uh, the fact that we're not getting our uh, selection mechanisms right and that there's a, an issue um, between that sort of an attrition rate and not only do we get the right half, I certainly hope we do, but what's happened to those others in the, in the interim and in the meantime. And then the last thing I think um, I'd like to leave you with is while selection me mechanisms are incredibly important, while it is imperative that we continue to do this work and, of course, the um, Effectiveness Research Hub is a great way to do that. Let's not forget that, there are other, uh, that uh, selection sits in a continuum of a range of other things as well. Selection can't carry all the weight for the success of a, a program or a course or a, um, a provider. There are uh, value-add that must happen within the course itself and then work that needs to continue after a graduate gets into school, into a school situation. So yes, it's hard. Yes, it's emergent. Yes, it's worthwhile. Thank you. Some of uh, anecdotal, I'm going, to, I'm going to put in a, a case here for anecdotal evidence that we've got of the numbers of people who, uh, as soon as we, as soon as we meet them in meetings, there is a, there are a number of people who we've got to say, how did they get through? How are they here? What, what, what is it that led them to teaching? And the, I don't know, uh, it, the, the, the gut feeling. Um, more often than not, uh, is a is an accurate one. Um, do you want to respond to that, Clarissa? Cool. Um, I think that there's a few things. One of the good things about the data is that we're able to see across the whole cohort, and certainly in the wider one, individuals with feedback from program coordinators, individual experiences of particular candidates, we know.
conversation about what, what we see working. I, I don't, I don't think that's going to be funded a little better. I think we could do a lot better. Yeah. So what, one piece of evidence from what's happened since Teachers for Lack of Love, we know in every course, of course it doesn't happen at all, but you get people that had the first practice, three years before they go to practice, there's a problem. This year's been the biggest drop ever in terms of the problems we've had. And whether that evidence for Teachers for Lack of Love, we don't know, but I still think you make a good point about how we actually capture some of that information. And also the attrition in the course itself, just trying to change the way it changes. Learn that. Um, I want to make a couple of comments actually, Dolly, and I don't know the answers to these, so okay. not a criticism, right? Um, but the issue, let's set the issue around um, students, initial teacher education students who finish their course who are being teased Aboriginal, which may have an impact on their learning. Oh, sorry. Okay. Usually I have a bit of teacher voice. Okay, um, so so let's just consider that for a moment. So there's a couple of things that flagged for me. One is, I mean, from my point of view, um, these kids deserve the very best teachers we can find, right? They deserve all the characteristics of what the research talks about in terms of teachers. They need um, opportunities to learn. They need uh, teachers who are going to care. They need teachers who will give them excellent feedback. Teachers who will give them good scaffolding in terms of their learning, all those sorts of things that are required. But I need something a little bit more, right? I need teachers who will cross a divide. So so to me there are two flags around this and I haven't I don't know enough detail yet around um, you know how you do the multiculturalism thing and the, the sort of look at that. I might take the test myself. <laughs> but but there's two. One is the number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students who get into the courses, right? And I've only had the experience in Melbourne. You know, we've got something like 14 this year. It's not a lot out of a thousand. It would be nice to be able to get it bigger. And one of the issues might be the GPA. I don't know. So if you've got a GPA, we know all the research actually um, talks about the kids that are going to come in across all those divides, leaving school, leaving uh, undergraduates, going into are going to be, no, there's no question, that's oh. just, you back off, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so what we've got an issue is around the GPA, because the, while we might have a range amongst Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students, you're going to have less numbers up in the, in the GPA that you might be requiring you to pursue. So we need, um, we need to consider that, because we'd like more into the course, not that I'm saying, just because you're Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, that you're going to be the best teacher out. Right. How did you know so, that? No, you're not. Sorry? How would you know that information? Yeah. But the cultural awareness is more. Well, I don't know about it. It's not yeah. that original. Yeah. No, I understand so. that. It doesn't necessarily have to be. But the other issue is, I guess, as a, as a sense of, is what. How do we tell that the students who are coming out of here, how, what would we test, what would we look at that are going to be able to cross that divide? Because they're going to meet these students who they may not know this in their personal group of friends, but they're actually going to have to stretch quite a lot to be able to pick up their students, to be able to pick up their backgrounds, to be able to pick up the right? So, but also, so they're just a couple of comments. But also, most teachers at some point are going to teach Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. Yeah, in different so contexts, right? right? So urban context, regional context, remote context. One of the messages I want to get across today is that the hub is not only focused on selection. No, no, four no. seminars through the year about four different projects, and one of them very much can relate to that. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. But selection, maybe selection is the selection. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, one of the things that I think is going to be important um, is raising the point that we need to think about a set of standards that help us understand what we should be doing in terms of selection. And I think that, for us, is going to be important in thinking about our so you know, is there a, a set of standards for selection that we need when we consider what types of processes we're using, we need to be talking to our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community and say, well, you know, what are the what are the right things to be questioning? Yeah. Is there a question about the longitudinal studies? So you were talking, Sam, I think you mentioned the kind of picture at the end of what you're looking for in terms of student attainment. Mapping our way back, and then commented on the data 
asset, the risk asset that you're gathering. Um, just want to sort of check in on your thoughts about how are you able to, or have you thought about the ways of, of the hanging on to the progress and the journey of the qualified selection through to outcomes in classrooms and their retention and ultimately their impact in, in learning? So, um, as, as most of you know, we, we do have a risk data set from the future selector. So when our students, when our candidates come in, we have, we're building a profile, a profile that presents, a profile that's going to allow them to develop goals and move forward. It's our intention that as they move through the future preparation system, that we will be able to track their um, progress on their uh, future readiness system using tools like Visible Classroom. Um, and because we have the Visible Classroom tool, we can actually take profiles, we can say to teachers, okay, these are the things that you may need to work on, these are the self-regulation of how do you develop those skills. We can then provide information about a teacher's capacity to um, support instructional practice that's rich and solid in terms of frequency of the work they're doing, we will be providing um, a way that our candidates can um, redo, if you like, the future selector tool at the end, so when they leave, um, they have a testimonial. This is where I am. But you also see if you have, you as an institution, have added any value. That's right. So, so we can actually um, provide that information, then provide that information to us. We are not developing them, we need to know that. So what I want you to think about is collecting the data for each individual teacher and providing them with the information means that they can, throughout their career, start progressing and start thinking with a developed mindset and their own impact. We, because we have that information, we will be able to relate that to student attainment, opportunity for learning. Thank you. Last one more. So, I was just wondering, the raw multi-method you use, the raw private resources you use, and the cost of coming back. So, is, have you actually considered that in the market at all? Because, you know, students will be paying at the end of their course for a, a national test. Are we talking about charging students at the beginning of their selection process to come in? And the feedback will be the university from the impact it will have. Does that make sense? There's no doubt that what we're being tasked with doing from PMA, and certainly what Melbourne is doing, requires an enormous amount of resourcing, time, and thinking. Um, the argument for us is if we embed these processes now, we will be much more successful down the line. Um, so in terms of using different methods, we do need to consider not only financial resources, time, energy, etc., but we need to consider the capability of us as teacher educators to be able to do the things that we're talking about. Um, and I, I think we all need to recognise that that's going to um, place somewhat of a burden on what we're doing. And we need to manage that. Um, any form of assessment and evaluation needs to be feasible and usable and be embedded. But it is going to require an institution to think about uh, what's required to achieve that. Yeah, that's the point. I'm going to bring this to a close because we have run out of time. And I know I have um, a few hats, rather you would say, in my actual hat. And I have lots of that hat on. I'm here at the university. And one of the things I think that um, we want to get the message across here today is that this is a research project. Um, it is costly and sometimes in research you do things that end up not working out the way you want. That's the nature of it. And certainly one of the things in response to your question is how can we come up with the research evidence that points to a much more streamlined way. And I think what you heard today is the proof's not there yet. And I think certainly the major point of today was to have the first of a series of rolling seminars and I know the hub is planned. Um, I certainly challenged my colleagues here at the university in my job as director of research over the last four years to name the institutions in the world that are world famous in doing research on teacher education effectiveness. 
Um, so those are now handed off to seven, and now they've got past four. So there are 17,000 of them. And so the, one of the intents of the half is to start to be one of those first of all, those eight places where we have a focus of doing research around teacher education. And that's a prime moment, therefore, going forward, we're looking at. So during um, the next year, we will be having various forums um, asking you as teacher educators to come and join us to help to position the hub's research on teacher education effectiveness. We don't believe we can do this by ourselves. So we will be asking you to come and join us to talk about what we should be doing. We will be talking about the nature of teacher education effectiveness and diversity. We're going to ask Liz and Lorraine Graham to, to join us on a forum. And we certainly will be talking about teacher evaluation. As with all of these forums, we will be producing a discussion paper that will go on our website and will be available to you. Uh, it'll just be sitting there. It'll have all the evidence that we have. Um, and we hope that this will contribute to discussion and collaboration. That's the whole idea of this forum. Thank you all, Madam Lord, that's the team. I'd like to thank Margaret first for the discussion. I've got the harvest roles in here because you had to listen the clearest and the most in the whole session. Georgia, uh, helping us with this understanding of what the research basis that the team has been doing over the last maybe three or four years now. And Larissa and Janet for your presentation today and also for starting this work. You also mentioned there are other people here, Ricard, Gerard, uh, Tony, in terms of putting up the, some of the other parts of the tour that you're doing and the work you're doing. And so it's trying to give a sense of a rich kind of uh, penalty of things that are happening in the Senate. So if you please join me in thanking them. Because you say, because you listen, because you ask questions, we actually are going to give some refreshments. What you'll notice when you go outside is that we do have another group that has been refreshed and rewarded. <laughs> and some of them might still be there. Um, our uh, uh, food and is better. Can we go there? on that side of the hallway. So please join us. Uh, we're more than happy to have any questions, etc.
Yeah. How are you? Thanks for meeting me the other day. No, it's a pleasure. I, I ran into Nicky today and I said if we'd had a chance to catch up. Yeah. And other ones planned. <laughs> I'll catch up with you soon because I've already got a student who's almost finished. Uh, really? Coming. Yeah, she's okay. going to fly here. Uh, but, yeah, I'm not hanging around though, but um, yeah, no, right, catch up with you. Okay, thanks, Jane. Nick, go ahead. You just do what you do. No, 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 yours was yours was good for the job as well. And good. But um, no, it's great. It was very clear, very composed. It was great. Absolutely. No, but it was. And the story was very clear. No problem. Yeah, just reassuring you if someone Yeah, because if got anything went wrong, I wouldn't even have mm. the faintest idea where to start. I'd start pushing buttons. Yeah, it's not a good thing, is it? Mm. I'll do that to the rest of Is that you? Yes.